Hello, guys, and welcome to Truth and Transparency. Welcome. It is, what is today? Thursday? Thursday evening? Well, it's Thursday evening for me. I'm not sure what time it is for you guys, but I want to give a special shout out to all of you guys out there, mods. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for modding. Um, members, new or old, you're much appreciated. And uh, all of you guys, subscribers. So thank you guys for being here. Um, this is one of three. Uh, lives. I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, this is one of three. And these are what TNT myself believes. Um, and Taylor is speaking about when she's talking about that she's requesting three um, officers training um, records. So um, behind me here, I have, I'm going to try to do this. I have uh, a special appearance here. Let's see. See how this looks. Boy. We got some of this going on today, so. Whiteboard Wilma, you know, she's got some love back there, so there you go. But, um, all right. Also, I may throw a couple things up on the screen for with Hector. So, you know, just going to do my thing. Um, but again, we're going to jump right into it and we're going to start with a 2020 case, 2020. And here you go. Well, a North Idaho man accused of shooting and killing a fellow chiropractor suffered a brain injury when he was arrested last week. And that's according to his lawyer. Daniel Moore appeared before a judge in Bonners Ferry this morning, and he was arrested last week and charged with shooting and killing a man back in March. Moore is a chiropractor from Bonners Ferry, and the man he's accused of shooting was a chiropractor in town as well. Authorities haven't said why they believe Moore killed the man, but court documents say the victim was shot in his back through a window. The man died in his office, and this morning, Moore's lawyer expressed concerns that he was questioned by police after that brain injury. A judge then granted a request for Moore to be transported to a local hospital to receive an evaluation. And court to be given to the defense. Again, um, the court's read the probable cause affidavit that led to Mr. Koberger's arrest, and the court can see that this vehicle identification was heavily relied on by the state to arrest Mr. Koberger, as well as to obtain a lot of other search warrants. This is information that is very necessary for us to prepare our case. I don't think Mr. Thompson and Ms. Jennings are withholding anything. I think they don't have it, but I think we need a court order with a deadline so that we can get that. As the court is aware, um, the state has a duty to provide discovery to the defense. All right. All right, so what you guys saw right there before I clicked over to Anne really quick is um, 2020, there was a, uh, a chiropractor that was shot at his office. 
um, Dr. Drake. What I'm going to show you guys here is I'm going to show you um, what transpired in 2020 to feature um, ISP Detective Tolson. Tolson was hired by um, ISP in 2007. Tolson came from Oakland, California. Um, Tolson uh, did some work with Bonner's Ferry. This was uh, work that was done out in Bonner's Ferry in 2020. Um, and it has to do with an arrest of one chiropractor for the murder of another. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> um, I'm going to zoom in here for you. Again, Tolson was involved in, uh, Idaho four case. And Holson was involved in the interrogation, in the investigation into um, Dr. Moore was arrested, and he was arrested for another chiropractor's murder. So um, I want you guys to check this out. If you see it highlighted in green, um, those are points I'm going to be talking about that correlate directly to the case, the out of four case. Um, if it's I'd, if it's highlighted in yellow, it's about just facts are really important. But basically, what ends up happening is is that um, Tolson is involved with two other, uh, one other detective from ISP, uh, and the police chief, the assistant police chief of Bonner's Ferry, to get this um, this man, this other doctor, Doctor Moore to false confess after asking for a lawyer multiple times. But not only that, they messed up timestamps of surveillance cameras to do with a white um, truck that they fudge in reports to make it seem like it's this guy's vehicle. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at exactly Tolson's tactics and, and what they used and how they obtained the arrest of somebody that they flat out knew did not do this, this, this murder. Um, but why not just go get the, the right person? This murder is still um, unsolved today, by the way. So here we go. Now, Dr. Moore and his wife were prominent figures in the community. He, like I said, had a very successful um, chiropractic business. His uh, wife, nurse practitioner, um, and she was involved with the community. These two people, their lives were turned upside down based on Tolson's um, and two other officers' antics. Um, so I'm just going to give it to you straight. That way you can just follow along straight from the reports. Um <clears throat> Dr. Moore's false confession and his arrest and uh, detention following the wrongful, wrongfully brought and pursued murder charges were the direct result of egregious misconduct by defendant officers of the Bonners Ferry Police Department and the Idaho State Police. These officers deliberately denied Dr. Moore his constitutionally secured rights by ignoring his multiple requests for the assistance of counsel, threatening first-degree murder charges if he didn't confess, and using other abusive, overreaching, and coercive techniques to extract a false confession. <clears throat> the murder charges were brought after Ryan, um, that's the last name of Martin Ryan, one of the assistant police chiefs, uh, with the consent and encouragement of ISP detective Tolson, unlawfully extracted a false confession from Dr. Moore during a custodial interrogation of him on August 27, 2020. Four different times, Dr. Moore, on four different occasions, asked for counsel. The false confession followed that the threat, uh, I'm sorry, the threat that Dr. Moore would be charged uh, with first-degree murder, a crime carrying the death penalty in Idaho, 
if Dr. Moore did not abandon his request for counsel and adopt the narrative that the officers fed him during their interrogation about how Drake was murdered. False confession followed Ryan's use of other highly coercive interrogation tactics designed to overbear Dr. Moore's will and force his false confession. Absolutely no physical or forensic evidence tied Dr. Moore to the crime. Let's check it out. After the only evidence against Dr. Moore was suppressed, which was this false confession, he was finally able to secure the dismissal of the charges against him on May 12, 2021. He was arrested on August 27, 2020. But suppression of the false extracted confession and dismissal of the criminal charges did not end the nightmare for the Moors. Defendants Chief of Police Zimmerman, Assistant Chief Ryan, ISP detectives, Polson have failed to undertake reasonable efforts to locate the actual perpetrator of Drake's murder, thereby failing to fully exonerate Dr. Moore. Instead, ISP detectives, to include Tolson, have stood by their position that Dr. Moore is the perpetrator still to this day. <clears throat> Officers of the Bonnie Ferry Police Department, at the direction and under the supervision of defendants Zimmerman and Ryan persistently stalked, persistently stalked Dr. Moore's business, driving their marked patrol vehicles up and down the alleyway next to his business and parking their vehicles in public view of the location of Dr. Moore's business in Bonners Ferry. <clears throat> they still have all of his crap, by the way, everything that they took. Um, now, Let's get into the events and to what happened. So um, at all times relevant here to defendant Gary Tolson was employed as a detective with ISP and an agent of the Bonners Ferry Police Department acting under color of law. There was also two, uh, a, Jane, a Jane Doe and a John Doe. So they don't know to this day who came in the interrogation room, but I highlighted that because I'm curious of the, to know the other people involved, but. Here are the factual allegations. This is what they, this is the investigation that they did. And you need to see the parallels, okay, of what has gone on in the Idaho 4 case. And I need you guys to listen to what um, Ann Taylor talked about, which was um, these officers training, they said that they had, um, they were certified and trained in like trauma. And I'm going to get into that to wrap everything up. Um, but these were officers that she's requesting that were that played crucial roles in this this case. Um, they made decisions um, on how an investigation would go. Why go this way? Why not go that way? Wait till you see the parallels of what just took place. I mean, this guy's is just a couple years ago. Um, is Dr. Moore in jail? Thank God, no, he's not. By the way, so I'm gonna ask that. So. Oh, it's it's going to be good what they're actually trained in. It's it's mind blowing what they consider this, but we'll we're going to get to all of that. All right, here we go. Dr. Brian Drake was a practicing chiro chiropractor who lived in Hayden, Idaho, with his wife Jennifer, and their four children. Um, Dr. Drake worked alone uh, with uh, with offices in which he saw patients. So those are the areas. Um, during the period that included the early months of 2020, Dr. Drake would spend approximately two nights per week in Bonners Ferry, where he would see patients and spend the night away from his family in Hayden, about 71 miles away. Um, during one such trip to Bonners Ferry on March 12, 2020, not long after seeing his last patients of the evening, Dr. Drake was shot through the window of his office and struck with a bullet in his back, causing his death. Dr. Drake's office was situated approximately 16 feet from a building to the southwest known as the Far North Coffee Lodge. The space between Drake's office and the Far North Coffee Lodge was utilized as a drive through window for the coffee shop. And they wanted noted that the Far North Coffee Lodge was owned and operated by defendant Ryan's brother-in-law, his like 
Ryan's wife worked there as well. <clears throat> um, Dr. Drake saw his last patient on March 12th, um, around 7, 17 p.m. The timestamps from Dr. Drake and his wife's telephone conversation made by Drake after his patients left established that Drake was shot at approximately 7, 26 p.m. They had two eyewitnesses. They would report seeing a two-toned white and tan Ford-style pickup truck near Drake's office building when they were leaving. Okay. Dr. Moore's vehicle at the time of Drake's shooting death. Now, this is highlighted in green because this is a parallel. Very, very parallel of um, the case, the Idaho 4 case. Um so Dr. Moore's vehicle at the time of, of Drake's shooting death was an all-white four-door 2019 Toyota Tundra. In his sworn affidavits for probable cause to search Dr. Moore's residence, storage unit, business, and vehicles, and also to establish probable cause to charge him with second-degree murder, um, Van Leeuwen would not accurately describe the patient's description. And Based when they did this, uh, the, the affidavit for probable cause, yeah, it's kind of like one of those pain situations where his name was on it, but it was like a, you know, the best way to say it is like group think. A bunch of people did it, um, like to help in this probable cause, just same way as the Idaho 4 case. Um, but Van Leuven would not accurately describe the, pa um, the patient's description of the pickup truck as a two-tone white and tan Ford style pickup truck. Instead, Van Leuven described it as simply a white large pickup truck so that the description would match the description of Dr. Moore's all white Toyota Tundra pickup truck. It should be noted right here, the eyewitnesses described a running man and do not identify more in a lineup, okay? And eyewitnesses named <clears throat> um, Thunderbird, Isaac and his wife, Damn fly. I'm going to Miyagi that thing. They were outside. Um, Thunderbird was outside his apartment at Bonner's Ferry when he reported by 911. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, an eyewitness named uh, Isaac Funderburg um, was outside his apartment in Bonner's Ferry when he reported by 911 call, call having heard a gunshot across the street. Um, you know, he gives all this description, and the figure he saw reminded him of a clerk he knew from a local gas station. But right here, you see Funderburg reported seeing an adult male dressed in dark colored clothing walking northwest from between Dr. Drake's building and a fence on the north side of the building. Um, a description that it was so inconsistent with Dr. Moore's appearance. When Funderburg yelled, hey, was that you referring to the gunshot? He saw this person run away toward a business located not far from Dr. Moore's office. Funderburg's fiance also heard the shot and observed the figure running away to the northwest or northeast rather. They were later shown a photo lineup that contained Dr. Moore's photograph. Neither identified Dr. Moore as the person they saw running from the scene of the shooting of Drake. Indeed, their description of the running man was of a person with different skin and hair color and in an entirely different statute. Okay. This is going to get wild, so bear with me. This gets straight wild. Um, Dr. Drake's phone was required or recovered, and the call times with his wife were confirmed. Dr. Drake's blood alcohol content. So here you go. Those people that don't think that they're going to take the, they're not going to have toxicology reports. I do believe that they will. Dr. Drake's blood alcohol content, um, as determined by his autopsy toxicology report, was 0 0.081 over the legal limit to legally drive an automobile in the state of, of Idaho. 
Now, alibi witness, Mickey McMahon. This is a coroner, guys. Dr. Moore had an alibi. Dr. Moore had an alibi. His alibi was Mick here. Mick is a coroner. Okay, prominent people here. All right? So, Dr. Moore... So during their investigation, law enforcement spoke with Dr. Moore two times prior to calling him into their offices for a custodial interrogation. Now, those of you guys that don't think that ISP and people are going to call people, um, they were. They do. So they call people. They called this guy, Mick, two times before they actually had him in. Uh, Dr. Moore disclosed that he had spent the evening of March 12, 2020 with his close friend, he is a coroner. <laughs> On May 19th, 2020, ISP detectives interviewed Mick, who confirmed that Moores were very close friends and spent time at his home frequently. Further, Mick confirmed that Dr. Moore was at his home on the evening of, of Drake's shooting from at least 6.15 p.m. until around 8.30 after the shooting had, had occurred. So, again, they said that the shooting had occurred like right around 7.30 He's like, he was at my house, 6.15 to 8.30, okay? Giving him, like, I mean, a pretty sound alibi here, okay? Now, <clears throat> after charging Dr. Moore with second-degree murder, Ryan, again, this is the assistant police chief, confronted Mick in a hostile way about having provided an alibi for Dr. Moore's whereabouts on the evening of Dr. Drake's murder. Ryan suggested that Mick's alibi was causing people in the law enforcement community to not want to work with him in his professional capacity as the county coroner. This contact was egregiously designed to harass and dissuade Mr. Millette from providing an alibi for Dr. Moore and violated the laws of the state of Idaho, which prohibit efforts to intimidate witnesses to prevent their testifying in criminal proceedings. Now, this is the Drake family and Jennifer Drake. At the time of the Drake's death, at the, at the time of Drake's death, his family was suffering financial hardship resulting um, from Dr. Drake's inability to meet the family's expenses with his business income. At or near the time of Drake's tragic death, the Drake family had resorted to seeking financial assistance from their church. Um, this goes into the, you know, the alleging of that he was improper with patients, the alleging that he was cheating, um, and the alleging that he was developing an alcohol dependency problem. Okay. Um, he actually had a practice out in Austin, Austin, Texas. The Drake family had moved to Idaho from Austin, Texas, after Dr. Drake had an inappropriate contact with a female patient in Austin. This female patient, through her legal counsel, had made a demand for payment for the injuries Dr. Drake had caused her and threatened legal action. Dr. Drake attempted to resolve this dispute on his own and offered money to the female patient to resolve the dispute. Again, a bunch of things going on in this marriage. Jennifer Drake had secured a $1 million life insurance policy covering the life of her husband, Ryan Drake, prior to Drake's death, and said policy was in effect when Drake was shot. Um... Prior to starting his own business, Dr. Drake had previously practiced with other chiropractors in the Hayden and um, CDA area. Upon information and belief, um, they were having issues with people. Again, there was a staff member that, upon information and belief, so that's not been proven, um, but it is in papers. Um, Jennifer Drake reported to law enforcement that after the murder of her husband, that she believed one local chiropractor with whom Dr. Drake had worked previously was likely the shooter because her husband had taken several of the chiropractor's patients when Dr. Drake left the practice to open his own practice. This was a theme ISP and BFPD, Bonner's Ferry Police Department, would pursue at Jennifer Drake's insistence rather than pursuing Jennifer Drake as a suspect. Notwithstanding the potential for Jennifer Drake's involvement in the death of her husband, law enforcement failed to completely investigate her as a suspect. Rather than competently investigating Jennifer Drake as a potential suspect in her husband's death, defendants provided her details of the investigation, including engaging in regular text messaging with her and following the leads she proposed they follow, including the lead 
that the person who killed her husband was likely another chiropractor who lost patience and business to her husband. They were texting with her. Now, the interview with Dr. Moore. This includes Gary Tolson. This is person number one in the um, why Ann Taylor wants this person stuff that I believe. On March 24th, 2020, Dr. Moore cooperated with an interview with ISP detective um, Alder Alderson and Lehman. ISP did not record the interview. ISP did not record the interview. Do you guys see that? You see that? Moore offered his full cooperation and denied any involvement with Dr. Drake or the crime they were investigating related to his death. Um, now, this is where um, on May 6th, so this happens on March 12th, now we're to May 6th, and they met with Dr. Moore at Moore's office again to, to ask him questions. At this interview, like the one before, Dr. Moore denied having ever met Denied having met, ever met Drake and denied having anything to do with his murder. Denied ever meeting him, okay? This second visit by law enforcement focused on a gas leak. You guys, I can't even make this. The second visit by law enforcement focused on a gas leak that had occurred at Dr. Moore's office on Sunday, March 15th, 2020, that had rendered him unconscious. After Dr. Moore truthfully described the gas leak incident, Van Leuven and other law enforcement officers developed the unfounded theory that Dr. Moore had attempted suicide from his overwhelming sense of moral distress over having killed fellow chiropractor Drake. Oh my God, this is insanity. I read this like, what the fuck? I was like, am I reading this right? The guy he commit officers would later learn that members of Dr. Moore's staff had suffered headaches and complained of gas mall near the time of the gas leak that Dr. Moore had described, consistent with Dr. Moore's description of the event. Officers also learned during their May 6, 2020 questioning of Dr. Moore that he had suffered a leg injury that had rendered him incapable of running long before the murder of Drake. Surveillance footage. During law enforcement's investigation into Dr. Drake's death, they compiled what they purported to be surveillance footage showing the whereabouts of Dr. Moore's white Toyota Tundra on the evening of Drake's murder. This is exactly what they're doing now. Okay? Let's go ahead and highlight that. Yeah, green. It's green for a reason. Again, during law enforcement's investigation into... Um, Dr. Drake's death, they compiled what they purported to be surveillance footage showing the whereabouts of Dr. Moore's white Toyota Tundra on the evening of Drake's murder. Van Leuven swore in an affidavit that the footage showed that the footage showed Dr. Moore driving his Toyota Tundra near the area of Dr. Drake's shooting on the night of the shooting. And in the same time frame as the shooting. However, none of this footage is accurately timestamped. I want to remind everybody of something. The weekend of the murders, the weekend before that was, um, it, it was daylight savings. You had to toss your clocks, you know, um, you fall back, you spring forward. So you would fall back. Um, and I seen it in the Sheldon Jeter Jr. case. Um, I, I've seen it in local stuff that if some of the stuff, if it's not, you know, auto switched or whatever on people's ring cameras and things like that, you could be looking at someone's camera and it's say 415, but it's because they didn't, they forgot to take it back. So it's really 315. So, um, I think that it's still 100% in play that depending on what cameras they're looking at, are these even the accurate timestamps based on 
the weekend before and it being, you know, daylight savings. And But um, here, that's not even an issue. Check this out. However, none of this footage is accurately timestamped. None of this footage shows Dr. Moore driving the white truck depicted in the photos. Exactly the same as with Brian. None of this photo, none of this footage shows Dr. Moore driving. None of the footage that they have show Brian driving. None of the surveillance footage depicts a license plate of a vehicle which belongs to Dr. Moore. You guys cannot, this language is just insanity. No license plates, okay? This is just wow. August 27, 2020. This is the interrogation now. Desperate to name a suspect in their long-running investigation into Dr. Drake's death, just like the Idaho 4 case, law enforcement lured Dr. Moore to the county sheriff's annex for an interrogation. During this interrogation, defendants Ryan Vandler and Tolson colluded, colluded, to extract a coerced false confession from Dr. Moore. Um, this false confession followed a custodial interrogation of Dr. Moore, which exceeded three hours from the time law enforcement lured him to the sheriff's annex to the end of the uh, custodial interrogation and his formal arrest. This interrogation was uh, continued by law enforcement despite Dr. Moore's repeated requests for counsel first made just 15 minutes into the interview and repeated at least three additional times during the course of the interrogation. On the date of the interrogation, Tolson, with the assistance of other officers and agents of the Idaho State Police and the Bonners Ferry Police Department, this is how they lured him, lured Dr. Moore to the county sheriff's annex via a request that he provide law enforcement with his wife's 38 APC handgun for inspection in connection with their investigation into Drake's death. Law enforcement was well aware that this firearm was not involved in Dr. Drake's death. After a brief wait at the sheriff's annex, Dr. Moore was confronted by multiple law enforcement officers, some in uniform, who instructed him to empty his pockets. Law enforcement then frisked Dr. Moore and explained that they were taking him to a secure area requiring them to check for weapons. Law enforcement secured the keys to the car Dr. Moore had driven to get there. Dr. Moore's cell phone was left in his car. Apart from the two subsequent bathroom breaks, law enforcement recorded the entirety of their interrogation of Dr. Moore on video. So they have this all on video. And that's how this is transcribed. This lawsuit is literally taking the video and inserting all of this. <clears throat> Dr. Moore, um, less than five minutes into the interrogation, um, Dr. Moore, of his interrogation, uh, Van Leeuwen informs Dr. Moore that he is a suspect of killing Dr. Drake and attempting suicide via gas poisoning due to his sense of guilt. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what a bunch of what? Like, <coughs> Dr. Moore is quick to deny his involvement in Dr. Drake's death, and naturally, any consequence of feelings of guilt or desires to start home. Following this accusation, Tolson asked Dr. Moore a series of questions establishing his ownership of a white Toyota Tundra pickup that he exclusively drives that vehicle. His presence at Mix a family friend's home several blocks away from Drake's clinic on the evening of the shooting and a brief trip he took to his own office, roughly eight minutes into the interrogation. Van Leeuwen uh, belated informs uh, Dr. Moore of his Miranda rights. After being read his rights, Dr. Moore reaffirms his non-involvement in Dr. Drake's death and his total lack of relationship with the man. Total lack of relationship with the man. Isn't that what Annie's saying? And he's like, we have no connection here. Um, Mr. Kohlberger doesn't know, like, they have not even established a connection. Like, what's going on here? Um, again, so if it's in green, it's because it has um, 
yeah. Um, Dr. Moore does readmit that he drove to Mick's house on the evening of March 12, 2020, in his white truck, and that he did so by himself. Following Dr. Moore's repeated assertions of innocence, the detectives present him with an exaggerated accounting of the state's evidence they claimed implicated him in Drake's homicide. Wait till you hear what they say. After Dr. Moore continues to deny any involvement in Drake's death, Van Leuven suggests that the shooting was a mistake and that Dr. Moore simply wanted to scare the other chiropractor out of town due to some variety of professional disagreements. <laughs> scare him out of town. Over Dr. Moore's denials, Van Leuven falsely asserts that they had sufficient evidence to convict him of first-degree murder at a jury trial, pointing to surveillance video footage they claimed to put him in and around the scene of the crime at the time the shot was fired through Drake's window. However, Van Leuven assert, assured Dr. Moore that he would be facing a lesser homicide charge if he would simply admit, admit that he only intended to scare Dr. Drake when he shot into the window and did not mean to, to kill him. Van Leeuwen then informs Dr. Moore that law enforcement was at that moment serving warrants at his residence and businesses and that his truck was also being towed down to Coeur d'Alene pursuant to a warrant. Following several minutes in which the detectives apply pressure by telling Dr. Moore that they have proof of first degree murder, and if he doesn't explain himself, they will bring those charges against him. Dr. Moore says, well, I didn't shoot him and I'm sorry, but that's just what it is. Dr. Moore then raises both of his palms facing the detective in a stop gesture and says, so I guess if you're going to do that, uh, I each charge him with murder, then I need to get an attorney. I need to get an attorney. The clarity and lack of ambiguity in this assertion of his right to counsel is well understood by both Tulsa and Van Leven because the detective sigh in obvious displeasure at the, at the required termination of their interrogation. They gather their things, they stand up, and they leave the room super pissed. While leaving the interrogation room, Van Leeuwen asks Dr. Moore if he has a cell phone on his person. Dr. Moore responds in, in the negative and states that it's in his vehicle before exiting the room. <clears throat> they instruct Moore to sit tight and indicate they'll be right back. Law enforcement did not come right back. While Dr. Moore sat isolated in the secure room at the sheriff's annex, he was not supplied. He was not supplied with a phone call to an attorney nor any means of communicating with the outside world. Dr. Moore sat in the room for approximately 45 minutes with no contact from anyone. While Dr. Moore sat in the interrogation room, Van Leeuwen and Tolson met with Ryan, the assistant police chief, who had been monitoring the interrogation of Dr. Moore. During this period of period of Dr. Moore's isolation, Tolson, Van Leeuwen, and Ryan decided that what Dr. Moore said was somehow unclear and that the interrogation would continue. <laughs> oh my God. This is insane. Um, again, the Tolson is um, the ISP, Gary Tolson, um, ISP, he sat in on the autopsies of the Idaho Four. He was involved in um, interviewing, uh, making decisions. Uh, they decided, um, but neither Van Leeuwen nor Tolson re-entered the interrogation room to seek clarification from Dr. Moore about his request for counsel. Instead, the collective decision was made to send Ryan in to resume the interrogation and leverage his pre-existing relationship with Dr. Moore as they had known each other for many years and their children were involved in common activities in the community. You guys are sick. I mean, I mean the shit in Idaho. Like, wow. Um, so this goes on, Okay. This goes on and he's trying to like get him to do, you know, to say what he needs him to say. <clears throat> um, and so that's what this is about. He says right here, I need to talk to an attorney then. He says, it, I mean, he says it multiple times. Um, 
again, I think I need to talk to an attorney. Um, but to carry on, here we go. Um, Ryan promises Dr. Moore that he won't be charged with first degree murder if only he makes a statement. But I promise you this, if you do, I promise you, I'll go talk to him about what booking we're looking at. I promise you that. And it won't be first degree murder. I can guarantee it. At this point, an unknown law enforcement officer knocks on the door, prompting Ryan to exit the interrogation room. Um, that's one of the John Doe's. Um, again, going back and forth, going back and forth. Um, and I, this is all tactics that are like, um, it, 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 they're gaslighting him. Um, I mean, he's asked for his lawyer at this point three or four times. Um, upon Ryan's return, Dr. Moore befuddled and stuttering his will overborn asked Ryan what he should do if he doesn't have an attorney, which is, which he at this point has asked for repeatedly, but had been repeatedly ignored. But instead, reiterating the interrogation and discussion about the crime, mentioning the killings impacted by the affairs, and ultimately back in the blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Again, this is how much it goes back and forth because they're guys. This person that the lawyer is, they documented everything based on timestamps of this interrogation. Um, Dr. Moore then gradually adopts the elements of Van Leuven, Tolson, and Ryan's narrative, which law enforcement fed to him over the course of the invest or over the interrogation, implicating himself in Dr. Drake's death. I cannot wait to hear what they did when they were interviewing Bethany, when they were interviewing Dylan, when they were interviewing fucking anyone. Um, yeah, Ryan tells him an attorney won't help him too. Yeah, that does come out. Um, following Dr. Moore's coarse false confession, law enforcement booked him into the county jail on charges of murder in the second degree on August 27th, 2020. Dr. Moore's arrest, okay, and subsequent imprisonment were the direct result of the unlawful extraction of a false confession by defendants Ryan Van Leeuwen and, Tol and Tolson. Again, Gary Tolson is, we believe, one of the people that she wants training records for. Um, so what ends up happening, and I'm going to show it here, is, of course, they arrest this man, this innocent man. They arrest him, and then they go... The ISP and, you know, police chief Bonnersberry, they go and they hit the media and they tell the media, because I'll, I'll, I'll read what they did, but I'll read it from here first. By August 29, 2020, law enforcement broadcast Dr. Moore's arrest and name him the perpetrator of the murder of Dr. Drake. ISP told the local press that they had uncovered compelling evidence implicating more as well as a potential motive for the shooting neither isp nor bfpd had uncovered any physical or forensic evidence to tie dr moore to drake's shooting at preliminary hearing on october 2nd 2020 the only evidence presented that implicated dr moore in dr drake's death was the horse false confession now think about back to Brian's, uh, what was supposed to be pre-trial, um, or preliminary hearing, rather, sorry. In granting Dr. Moore's motion to suppress his confession, the district court found in its February 12, 2021 memorandum decision and ordering granting motion to suppress that Moore's will was overborne by the badgering and overreaching of police such that his waiver of his Miranda rights to counsel was not made knowingly, voluntarily, and intelligently. Moore's subsequent confession was not voluntary, but rather was the product of police coercion. 
This is what the district courts found. The district courts found. That's what they ruled. Now, notwithstanding the loss of their only hope of prevailing on a secondary murder charge, law enforcement persisted with their persecution of Moore and did not propose dismissal. <laughs> After Dr. Moore was forced to file his own motion to dismiss the charges, the district court found that, quote unquote, the only evidence the state presented, the only evidence, at the October 2nd, 2020 preliminary hearing connecting Moore to Brian Drake's death, was the videotaped interview. Therefore, there is no admissible evidence in the record to establish that Moore committed the crime for which he stands charged. Now, this is what Ann Taylor is all trying to get her hands on. Like, what did you all give the grand jury? How was there a grand jury indictment? What did you give them? And if you guys didn't see today, um, Ann Taylor was able to get that order and she's getting, she's getting um, uh, her stuff for the grand jury. Okay. This is it in black and white. Well now yellow and green, but you know, um, if law enforcement had substantial and competent evidence of Dr. Moore's guilt, they could at any time bring charges against him. They have not done so. The Idaho Attorney General has appealed to the Idaho Supreme Court, the district court's finding of coercion and the district court's decision to dismiss the criminal charges. They do not appeal the finding that Dr. Moore's right to counsel was violated, though, nor that the state may not use Dr. Moore's false confession in their case in chief in any subsequent criminal proceedings so oh, that, you know, this is Moore's attorney pointing this out, that take a look at what they're actually, you know, appealing and what they're not appealing. Okay. And they did not appeal the finding that Dr. Urso, you know, when the state did their appeal, they did not appeal that the finding that Dr. Moore's right to counsel was violated, nor that the state may not use Dr. Moore's false confession in their case in chief in any subsequent criminal prosecution. In their November 12, 2021, opening brief to the Idaho Supreme Court, the Idaho Attorney General admitted that Ryan's conduct in extracting Dr. Moore's statements on August 27, 2020, was condemnable. <laughs> Dr. Moore awaits the decision of the Idaho Supreme Court in case number uh, on the issues appealed by the uh, Idaho Attorney General relating to whether the statement he supplied were coerced or not. And whether the charges against him were properly dismissed. And then these are the different counts that. They have the yeah, I can. These are the different counts that it's, it's up for. Uh, you know, you can just read the rest of all that, but it's just what they're what he's seeking, what they're seeking. But this, uh, yes, this is uh, cops that are involved in the same case with the Idaho. Let's take a look at something. Were these cops reprimanded? Oh, guess what's going on right now? Um, this is ongoing. They just had a hearing today. They just had a hearing today. Um, but there's a bunch of... Uh, um, there's a bunch going on. 
But what now I'm going to talk about is this training. Okay, this training. And um, hold on one second. Let me pull this up. Um, Oh, yeah, these officers are getting sued. Uh, their asses, by the way. Um, but let's take a look at this. So, this is just crazy to me. And, and this, if people are okay with this, hey, I could just tell you this: I would never live in Idaho. Um, Arrest made in chiropractor murder. Look at this guy, Daniel Moore. All family chiropractic. Look at this. Bonner's Ferry, a local chiropractor, was arrested late Thursday afternoon in the fatal March shooting of another chiropractor with ties to Bonner's Ferry and Hayden. Daniel L. Moore, 63, of Bonner's Ferry, was charged with secondary murder in connection to the death of Dr. Brian Drake, 45. Detectives made the arrest following an investigation involving multiple agencies. Okay. Okay. And several tips from the community. <laughs> oh my God. I'm sorry. I just can't, you guys. This is wild. This is all lies. This is all lies. This is sick. They ruined this man's life. They ruined his life. Detectives made the arrest following an investigation involving multiple agencies and several tips from the community. Idaho State Police said in a press release Friday announcing the arrest, Moore was arraigned on the charges Friday. He is in custody. ISP officials and de said detectives worked closely. <laughs> with the prosecutor's office and uncovered compelling evidence as well as a potential motive for the shooting. Oh my gosh. To avoid potential interference with the case. That information is not being released at this time or never because it is then. This is sick. Our interest from the beginning of this investigation was justice for the victim's family. The community was also compelled by this tragedy of this case. ISP detectives are extremely grateful to the individuals who came forward with information that was helpful in the moving in moving this case forward. You guys, this is this is sick. This is everything that that they're telling us about the Idaho four case. This is this is one of the. Um, this is August 29th, right after this guy was arrested. I cannot believe this. And this is a guy that's suing. Um, in search of Board of Chiropractic Physicians records, Moore was investigated in January of 2017 for offering and providing acupuncture services without holding an acupuncture license. And guess what? He paid his fine. Moore waived his right to a full hearing and was ordered in August 2017 to discontinue providing such services unless and until he received his acupuncture license. And then, but he also paid a fine. That's all that they could find on him. After responding to a report of shots fired, Bonner's Ferry Police and ISP troopers found Drake fatally shot. His family was informed of the arrest and in a statement shared by law enforcement expressed their appreciation for those working tirelessly and diligently to uncover the truth. <laughs> oh my God. However, those efforts cannot change the reality for Drake's widow, Jennifer, his parents and his children. So, um, yeah. Unbelievable. In a press release shortly after the shooting, Bonnie's very police department official said a person of interest 
was questioned in connection to the case, but was released without charges. However, they noted the person remained under investigation. It is unclear whether that person was more. ISP detectives assumed the lead in the investigation in early April at the request of BFPD. The two agencies have worked closely together throughout the investigation. ISP and Bonners Ferry investigators said they were assisted in the investigation by the FBI Violent Crimes Task Force in Coeur d'Alene, the Missoula, Montana Office of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tob Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, Coeur d'Alene Police Department, Canaan County Sheriff's Office, and the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office in Montana? What? Why? Why? Anyways, um, this is the work of the people that are involved in this case and that um, made the decisions to um, how they got to Brian Kohlberger. How did they get to more? Unfucking believable. And this is why, number one, Ding, ding, ding. Gary Tolson, ISP detective, is my number one. Hired in 2007, came from Oakland, California. He resides in a very pretty, pretty home, making upwards of over almost $50 an hour. In 2009, though, um, Idaho began doing a CCT program. Let's take a look. This is your um, crisis call training crisis call training crisis call training yeah cct program let's take a look at the cct program and this is what one of the officers says that they're trained in and this is like for trauma and to communicate with trauma uh, people what no um let's take a look at really what cct is <clears throat> Here we go. Oh, my God. All righty. Take a look at this, guys. Tops mm -mm -mm. EMTs received crisis call training 2009, March 21st, 2009. Okay. 30 North Idaho law enforcement and emergency medical personnel are better equipped to handle mental health crisis calls. Mental health, mental health crisis calls. After successfully completing a recent 40-hour crisis intervention training, training course. Again, this is just all voluntary. The week-long voluntary training program hosted by the Bonner County Sheriff's Office was held at the VFW Hall. I usually go there for dollar drinks. In Sandpoint, and also included multiple presentations in Coeur d'Alene. Law enforcement at all levels and experience from the five northern counties interacted with the judicial system, mental health professionals, hospital staff, family members, and consumers of mental health services. The goal of the program is to increase the safety of officers and the public, de-escalate difficult situations, and reduce repeat call-outs by connecting the mentally ill with appropriate community mental health services. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't. Did they think the 911 call was, was, did they think the 911 call was a mental, mental health crisis? I'm just curious. Um, 
The first two days of the program introduced officers to clinical disorders, medications, local and state hospital facilities, and staff. Quote, unquote. I wondered, what does this have to do with us? But after a few days, I could see the benefits of knowing what to look for when approaching a situation, said Terry Ford, an Idaho State Police Trooper for 23 years in Bonner County. This is the first training on mental illness. <laughs> I'm sorry. Crystal Beachy, a social worker with private agency, added, CIT develops interaction between the police and resources, trains officers to take extra steps for safety, encourages follow-up, which diminishes reoccurrences. CIT also attempts to develop relationships between law enforcement and consumers based on trust rather than fear. A family member shared the effects of living with mental illness from the perspective of an adult child, a spouse, and a parent. Those stories offered valuable insight and them better understand the situations they face, officer said. Oh my goodness. I had misconceptions and now have a better understanding of the diseases of the brain, mental illness, and the burdens the families bear. training was good and I gained respect for the officers who deal with so many types of situations. The training is another tool in the toolbox, says. He says, adding that he particularly benefited from learning court procedures from Judge Mitchell. Uh, let's get down to, let's see. Mm. Mental health consumer Les Newman was happy to have the opportunity to talk to the police officers, saying that with the training, police will be more aware, understanding, and may be less likely to misinterpret mental illness for some other disruption. CIT training is invaluable. Training for officers to build empathy and understanding that these are people that have a physical problem they cannot control says Holly Bonwell, clinical supervisor with Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. Training including, included intervention strategies and procedures. Finally, the officers participated in scenario training where they were called into a mock crisis situation based on actual cases. The actors included facilitator trainers, social workers, and family members. The goal was to help officers recognize symptoms of various disorders, use the tools of the training to safely de-escalate a situation and follow up by connecting people with the appropriate resources, organizers just said. Actors from the mental health sector said it was valuable to step into other people's shoes and they had a better understanding of police officers' roles as partners in difficult situations. The CIT training is brought to the five northern counties through the efforts of the National Alliance of Mental, mental Illness. CIT programs were developed in Memphis 20 years ago. The recent class was the first offering for the voluntary training in Region 1 and the only, and only the second in the state of Idaho. Gary motherfucking Tolson, police training specialist of peace officer standards and training, the licensing agency for training. He trains police officers, you guys. This is important. This is why. Gary Tolson, motherfucking Gare police training specialist of police officer standards and training, the licensing agency for training, viewed CIT as important and said it should continue and develop from this first program. CIT is certified by post. <laughs> Good old gear. In 2012, became certified to teach point- Point shoot, point shoot. It's a technique. Um, don't mind the fireworks. <sighs> this, this is insane. Um, so let me get this straight. C, I, T. Is for mental health. Yeah, point shoot technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fireworks for you again. 
every day, man. My neighbors just are like, Lana, you the shit. <laughs> um, wow. <clears throat> Let me tell you something else that happens with this, um, what I believe. Um, if they initiate a, once it becomes like a homicide like that, they initiate um, like troop teams that they're putting, it's, it's automatically like it's ready to go if when a situation arises like the Idaho 4 case. So I believe um, that when the call came back out about that it's, you know, this is actually not a unconscious person. This is, this is four homicides. Um, that that would have kicked in um, a, a team that would have been responding. Um, very similar to what they do in Pennsylvania when a team is responding. And if it involved like let's say, for example, the Pennsylvania State Police, they have like a troop A team, troop, you know, B, D, whatever. And it's a it's a team that goes and that's their investigative team. Um, and I believe that ISP um, had boots on the ground running. And just because Payne says that he was there, you know, at four o'clock, um, you guys, just so you know, like it wasn't that nobody was there from noon to four. That's not it at all. Um, I believe that ISP had a, um, had a team that was, that was sent. And I believe that Tolson was a part of this team and he was big in the beginning. Um, the, the middle and the end of, 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 of all of this, just like here you see with Dr. Moore just a couple years ago, so um, why Anne, I believe, wants these training records um, is because, remember that, remember the, um, like, where, where were the EMTs? Remember, no EMTs went in. The coroner didn't go in until, you know, so much later. Um, I think she wants to know who made those decisions. Like, who decided that? Why didn't the coroner go in? Um How did you know that nobody, you know, needed any assistance? And, um, but Tolson here and his tactics, you guys, there was a 120 officers involved in this. And this, this is just wild. But, um, how you could literally, be a part of and that's what the it says in the lawsuit um they all watched from the interrogation room outside you know just like you see on tv they're watching this and anybody that played a role in um what they did to dr moore uh and why him you know everybody says why brian Koberger? why brian Koberger? why dr moore why dr moore um How about the better question is, is how, why do these, why do these people have jobs? I'm sorry, but like one time doing this is one time too many. Like the Dr. Moore had nothing on him. No, nothing. He's, he's 61 years old, 61 years old. Do you think he just did a drive by? And took out some 45-year-old, you know, buff built, like, thinks he's probably like a Playboy bunny, you know. They didn't even know each other. Now, mind you, this happened in March. Okay, March. The, the, the shooting was March. August 27th, arresting him. Yeah, and I'm just about to get into that. And just to think that Idaho... Wait till you see how you're budgeting your money. You're going to be at a $1.4 billion surplus here at the end of the year. $1.4 billion surplus, Idaho. 
is going to be at. And you have Chief Fry just as recently as yesterday or the day, what was it? This past, it's been since the homicides uh, this spring, March till present day. You have police officers and police chiefs and detectives and whoever else is speaking out. And I'm going to show you the, the stats here. They are canceling. They are canceling police academies, saying that they can't afford them because it's too expensive. They don't have the funding. They don't have the funding. And I'm like, what the fuck? They're... They budget stuff for like the academy and for this post training, like one, I think it's $1 million a year. And they only gave them like 500,000. I'm going to pull it all up here, but it is damn insanity. Um, that they're saying that they don't have this budgeting. Um, they're going to be at a $1.4 billion surplus. So, like what if 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 I lived in Idaho and I saw this shit going on, it, your state police go everywhere. You know, your state police aren't just in um, Moscow or whatever. Even they they go where the help is needed. They've already asked for more money. Well, this has this has to do with um, just in general. Um, like, for example, um, speaking of which, let's look at this. There was a video motion hearing set today, 6-28-2023 at 11 a.m. So I'm going to get the, the results of that. This is for Mr. Moore. I'm trying to get the Gary Tolson's uh, comments on all of this and uh, any motion that he filed with that case. There, it's It's been going on since um, 2022. They're in a lot of water. Um Let's see here. Um, yeah, here it is. State budget analysts are projecting a 1.4 billion tax revenue surplus at the end of the year. And I call bullshit for the costs have gone up ridiculously for us. Idaho Post cancels police academies slated for the early 2023. Um, here you go. Listen. Bunch of it's a civil suit now. Yeah, it is a civil suit. Moore should get millions for what he's been through. We're continuing to follow a story we first broke on Friday. Idaho Peace Officer Standards and Training, or POST, canceled three academies scheduled for the beginning of next year. I sat down with POST Administrator Brad Johnson earlier today. He blames record inflation. In a message to Idaho law enforcement leaders last week, Johnson said they can't afford to hold three of their 17 academies next year. They canceled basic patrol, detention, and emergency communications academies. New officers have to go through post or a post-certified academy within the first year on the job. While a handful of large agencies have their own in-house academies like the Ada County Sheriff's Office, Boise Police, this hurts most Idaho agencies, which rely on posts to get new officers trained up and ready to go. Several chiefs and sheriffs told us last week they had new hires signed up, and so they're frustrated with these cancellations coming amid a law enforcement officer shortage, which we've covered here. This also comes after Post fought for the legislature to give them another $800,000 a year from the state's liquor fund on top of their four to five million dollar yearly budget. But Johnson says the cost of running these courses is now greater than the money coming in. And they acted as quickly as they could. That was intended to keep pace with that shortage that we'd had uh, year after year. And uh, it should have, except that <laughs> costs have gone up ridiculously for us. Um, and it's far more than we can afford within that revenue stream at this point. It's just a matter of us 
working more with the legislature and with the governor's office and hopefully identifying the proper amount of funding that we need to meet our mission. Johnson says they're getting the 64 impacted officers into their other academies later next year. They're going to do that as soon as possible. Post Council is also extending the deadline for officers to get certified beyond. Yep. This was published August, or October 21st, 2022. Just um, about three weeks before the murders. Good old gear. Um The, le the legislation passed um, HB 469 in March 2022 after Post fought for another steady stream of revenue. So something that Idaho, you go and at some point you have to take this, you have to go through this Post um, certification and when you get hired on, to, it's like your academy. Um, and then they offer, you know, certificates and training as you continue on through your uh, police career. Um, and Gary Tolson, he is, he's a teacher. He's an instructor. Gary Tolson instructs people at post. Um, Gary Tolson was part of railroading, as you guys could read in this um, allegedly railroading means, um, in, in getting um, Dr. Moore to falsely confess 61 years of age um, to murder that he did. There was nothing there. But the question would be, is why Dr. Moore? Just like the question would be, why Brian Koberger? You know, why? Um, and my, my question is, is fuck the why of why they pick them. How about no more of you? Once is enough. Once is enough because nothing, nothing, this isn't a, this isn't a mistake. They're still standing by that. They think that Dr. Moore is the perpetrator. Um, this wasn't a mistake. These actions with Dr. Moore, it's not a mistake. Think about what happens to you and your job. You know, um, this is, I mean, this is gross. It's disgusting. Um, so, and all that I see here is a reoccurring theme of um, greed and money. What um, the more what if, if if things are happening, then what happened from this tragedy? Well, a million dollars was donated. Um, money, 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 money. Um, but to hear that you don't have any money, but yet there's going to be a $1.4 billion, you know, surplus in Idaho, uh, for, um, for the budgets, uh, with law enforcement. And, um, that's just, that's just a flat out lie. <laughs> so pay attention to, you know, if you're, if you live in Idaho, you just, you just continue to get lied to. Um, but people are uh, dying. And then also people are, uh, you know, what would have been so hard about uh, going after just the right person or where the evidence led you in the, in this case is still not solved. Um, the murder of uh, Dr. Drake. It's just, I think it's harder to do what they're doing here, but I mean, you just investigate. This isn't a total like, oh my gosh, you know, he's not the guy. And where's anybody apologizing? You should expect to type in the name, um, Dr. Moore, 
Bonner's Ferry and, and be able to see a whole bunch of a whole bunch of stuff. No, you don't see anything like that. You don't see um you you can't find anything on this. It's very, very hard to find. So um moral of that story is is that if you think that uh Idaho is gonna come out and say we made a mistake with Brian Kohlberger, that ain't happening. They um they aren't doing it for the 61 year old man um, that they wrong, wrongfully um, accused and got to uh, confess. And trust me, this is a guy that like knows his rights. Imagine what these people did to these young kids. They destroyed them in any interrogation. Um, like, give us your DNA, give us your phones, do this, and then you're going to go down. I can only imagine what those interviews were like, those interrogations were like. So, but here, Gary Tolson, this is how he operates. Um, and you'd be a fool if you think that, that he just did that one time. So, um, my thoughts and prayers go out to the family of Dr. Drake's, um, you know, there's no justice there. I don't think that there ever will be. Um, and that's horrible. And Dr. Moore's family. Can you imagine giving your life, um, doing things all the right way and uh, about to go and retire and then this happens to you? You guys saw that beginning video and if you haven't, go back and watch it. But um, how you could do that to, you know, an older person is just, that's like old people and, and, and babies and children you don't mess with. I just, I don't know what's in the water in Idaho, but um, I know I'll be drinking bottled water when I'm there. So, um, yep, Gary, Gary Tolson, number one. These are the, these are the things you need to take away from it. This is what matches what has happened to Brian Kohlberger, or in this case. Number one, false vehicle description. Number two, the camera timestamps. Number three, these interviews. Number four, false statements, getting people to say false things. And it's not just a false confession. It's a false anything. It'd be the description of who you saw, Dylan, Bethany, all of that. Um, the tips. Oh, my God, them saying that they that they went through all these tips and the, the public helped them with tips. Nobody, there's no tips. You guys saw what the what the people were saying. They went the opposite way of what the tips were saying, of what the eyewitnesses were saying. Um, for heaven's sakes, Mr. Moore had the alibi of a coroner in, in the county, okay? Um, and then they never utilized the tips. So they went the complete opposite way with it. But then um, they were tracking, they said Mr. Moore's movements what they do just pick that white truck out and then find his and do the same type of thing and take these, you know, um, but, um, yeah, way too many, um, similarities in the way that Tolson led this investigation in 2020, uh, to what happens uh, and what's going on here in uh, Idaho four. So there you have it. There's number one, Thank you guys for being here. You guys rock. Um, I'm sending you some love in for being on time. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Catherine, welcome. East Coast, welcome. Elizabeth, thank you so much for the super sticker. Freckles, freckles and pickles. Cynthia. Welcome to the Transparency Membership. Thank you there, William. Got that badge going. Wanda, thank you so much. Super Sicker Joe, thank you for the Super Sicker. Why is Goldberger and his defense being mistreated by the state in such a bit? Breaking news, Cobra is actually black. <laughs> None of that's true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in case you didn't know, a, a new document came out. Documents. Um, Ann Taylor, 
got her order. She's getting grand jury stuff. So um, thank you, Lady Red, for joining membership. Laura, thank you for that um, super chat. I tell you what, you would make a fabulous private investigator. You rock. I just wonder, though, if Brian is guilty and then all this stuff will screw up all justice. No, it won't actually screw up all justice. Um, you know why? Uh, because it's the truth. Um, I don't think that, um, you know, sometimes in life, other things get um, exposed. Uh, so, but the truth is going to be the truth. And um, if Brian is involved, um, I think that Brian should be found um, guilty. I think if he's not involved, um, he should be found not guilty. Um, I think the evidence, it's either there or it's not. But seeing the work and seeing how these investigators operate is problematic for justice to happen, regardless of Brian Kohlberger. Take out Brian Kohlberger. Act like you don't have anybody yet. Um, how they go about investigating cases, it's not okay. It's not good. So um, when you when you find your wife's diary when looking for your keys, yeah, stuff like that. There you go, Donnie Trump. Um, so, but yeah, I think that I think we got two more officers to talk about and we will do that here in the next couple of days. Join me on Saturday night, um, 10 PM Eastern standard time. Emma Bailey's, um, passenger uh, Marilyn, who was uh, her passenger during the DUI, um, grew up with her. She is going to be live here on TNT for an exclusive interview. And we are going to, as well as with that interview, um, we are going to then watch the body cam and she's going to play by play us at different points. What was going on? What, what was going on that night? Um, we're going to be talking about the drug rumors. We're going to talk about a lot of things. And um, I think you're going to, you're going to enjoy it. So thank you. And until next time, I will take it. I'm the goat. Peace. Be kind of one another. I, and on your way out, thumbs up or thumbs down the video. You have an opinion. Make yourself known. Voice that opinion. Praise the Lord Jesus. Woo woo. I just want to say exclusive, exclusive, exclusive. Yeah, so Marilyn will be here. We're talking all about Emma Bailey, and we're talking all about Moscow. So. Whew. Thank you, Mods. Love you all.